So, I'm Vic Schoenbeck, and uh, today is February the 26th, 2017. And we're sitting in the Rizzo Conference Center, and I'm going to be interviewing Randolph Carter. So, Randolph, I really appreciate your taking the time to talk to us. Vic, good to be with you. And uh, I was going to ask you to start by telling me a little bit about your family, your parents, and where you were born. And sure. I think I grew, I was born in Pasadena, California, um, which for many people, you know, it's a small village, but when we talk about the Rose Bowl, everybody knows where Pasadena is. So I grew up uh, in, it was a kind of a sleepy little village until Rose Bowl every year. Uh, but when I was about four years old, we moved to Seattle, Washington, where my father had acquired a job working in the juvenile justice system. My mother was a school teacher, and both of them at that time had their master's degrees, which for African American middle class families was still not as common uh, as it has become for middle class families now. Uh, so they found jobs, and we went to Seattle uh, and settled into kind of the Northwest, which at that time, you know, maybe 10 years after World War II, was still kind of a small blue collar town. Um, so we came to Missouri. Yeah. In the early 1950s? Yes. And as I began my kind of matriculation through school, of course in 1955, Brown versus Board became law. It took several years for it actually to be established. And so by the time I got to high school, uh, there was this big push to get more African American children uh, into the public high schools that were still predominantly white. Now, you were in Seattle. Yes. Brown versus Board wasn't directed at Washington, was it? It wasn't, and that's a really good point because the Seattle School Board took, took this on voluntarily. But so were they, they were segregated under, beforehand? Schools were absolutely segregated it, in Seattle, Washington. I see. And this absolutely. was not by law, presumably. This was by... This was by, this was by basically racism, uh, where black people were able to buy homes, where they were able to shop, where their barber shops and hairdressers were, was all concentrated in a small strip in Seattle called the Central District. So it's neighborhood schools. It was neighborhood just the neighborhood schools. was assigned. The neighborhood, so, <laughs> and my father later got a job as the first African American to hold a statewide office. He was, direct, was the director of the Anti-Bias Board, which investigated employment discrimination, housing discrimination, and school so-called integration. Uh, the curious thing was that his place of work was in Olympia, Washington, the state capital, which, as you know, is about two hours from Seattle. Um, but we couldn't buy a home in Olympia. We would go there and they all, you know, we would go to make a deal on a house and all of a sudden it wasn't for sale. The irony that the director of the anti-bias board was being discriminated against in housing in the state capital didn't escape us. And at that point, my father, I mean, even I can recall having white and Jewish families come to our home, front for us, saying they were actually the purchaser. My parents would show up and all of a sudden the house was off the market. So we were experiencing the work that my father had been hired to do. And he decided at that point not to move the family, to leave us in Seattle. He commuted to Olympia. But he said that my family will continue this work you, <laughs> talking about me, will integrate a public high school in Seattle. Uh, so instead of going to Roosevelt, which was the traditional black high school where I wanted to go, I went to Roosevelt High School instead, which was predominantly white, affluent, not far from the University of Washington, encompass neighborhoods like Rollhurst where Bill Gates lives now, etc. So it was a family commitment to the work of civil rights. So you went to Roosevelt High School. What was the high school that you would have gone to otherwise? Garfield. Garfield. The Garfield Bulldogs were known as the place to be. People like Jimi Hendrix went there, Quincy Abbott. You know, just all these kind of wonderful people. Um, and I wanted to go there. <laughs> yeah, understandably. <laughs> my sisters went there, but at that time, when I was of age to go to high school, my father really wanted us to demonstrate a commitment. So you have older sisters? I have two older sisters. Two older sisters. Yes. Right. Any brothers or? No, just okay. older sisters. And what are they doing now? They're so my, uh, both of them became educators. Um, 
My older sister worked in the Renton School District, which is south of Seattle. My other sister worked in independent school in Seattle. Uh, they have both now retired, but uh, for many years, all of us. My mother, later I got into education, all of us were kind of doing our work in schools. This is fascinating. I'm really glad we're doing this interview because you hadn't said any of these things before. <laughs> Uh, so then you finished high school, presumably as a kind of normal high school student and so on, integrating the school. What happened as you were integrating the school? Was that, were you welcomed with? You know, Vic, it's, it, there were nine of us. Roosevelt High School had a, a student enrollment of about 2,400. Uh -huh. It was a, a big uh, high school with a reputation of being academically kind of at the top of the list. Uh, as I mentioned, neighborhoods that fit into it were affluent. Um, there were other high schools in Seattle where it was more blue collar. Uh, as you know, Boeing was a kind of a big employer there, so there were a lot of people who worked at Boeing. But they tended to go to other schools. The sons and daughters of the kind of academic elites that worked at the University of Washington went to Roosevelt. They went to Roosevelt. Unless they went to a private school. I it was, it was curious. I'm not sure that the cost of integration is, rarely, is really talked about. Um, but for all of us, even though we knew our job was to go there, no one really told us what to do. There was, to my knowledge, no training of the faculty, nor the administration, you nor mean, the white kids. You mean diversity <laughs> training. Right, absolutely, about inclusion. what we're trying to do. The idea that we would just go there and somehow change society was a huge presumption on the part of society, but it was a job we were kind of to do. So I was called the N-word probably every day. And I can remember going into a gym and early in my, you know, freshman year and somebody saying, here comes another one of those. And I couldn't see the person because it was a big gym. And I said, who said that? <laughs> At least come out. And, and uh, other things. I can remember walking down the hall with uh, a young woman that I became friends with, a white girl, Julie Pedro. <laughs> and we were just walking down the hall. And the vice principal came up to me and said, uh, Carter, go to my office. I said, I've got to get to class. He said, no, meet me in my office. One period goes by, two periods. Finally, he comes after I've been sitting there through two periods. He says, come in, I want to talk to you. I said, I said, I saw you and this young white woman walking in the hall, kind of holding hands. And I said, yeah. He said, that's not why we brought you here. I said, excuse me? <laughs> You're here to study. I don't want to see any of that foolishness anymore. I said, oh, I see. <laughs> I so that was the kind of environment. Wow. And I think the other thing, Vic, is that each one of us knew we were carrying our race on our shoulders. So I took all the AP courses. Uh, I was the vice president of the Swedish club. Um, Arthur Hall was a three-sport letterman from the day he walked into the school. Laura Jackson was the drama, you know, star. Uh, Bobby L, you know, so every one of us, I knew all of them because we all kind of uh, knew that we had this responsibility, but no one told us how to do it. I, I can even remember coming home sometimes and wanting to talk to my parents about it, but they were involved in their own battles. <laughs> you know, my dad was integrating the whole state, and my mother was teaching in a predominantly white, blue collar elementary school. My sisters were, you know, kind of off in there. So really, we, we had each other. And I remember even after school, some of us would get together and, and just kind of support each other and lament about what had happened that day. So it was a kind of interesting background. I, I later, you know, started getting some friends as years went by. In fact, two of my best friends now were students I went to school with. One is Jewish, one is white, and we're still in touch. And I asked them, you know, what do you recall about our years at Roosevelt? Because for me, there was a... I said, nobody told us anything. If I, hadn't, if I hadn't become friends with you, I wouldn't know any of this stuff going on. So it was a missed opportunity, I think, for diversity. Uh, and I think at that point in my life. Um, you know, as, as I'm, the, the, the white friends that you just mentioned, Maybe sometime you'll see them and you can record a story for, mm. for NPR. <laughs> well, I was, I was on NPR. Oh, really? When uh, there was a Supreme Court case, Seattle, and there were a couple other cities that were reviewing, uh, they wanted to somehow exempt them from the court orders. 
at NPR found me somehow and interviewed me and some other folks who had integrated our high schools and recorded that. I have you know, never got this transcript of it, but uh, but that's that was then, and this is now, all these years later, when I'm about to go to my reunion this summer, and I may see some of those folks. In fact, I'm going to encourage the guys that I've been in touch with to come. Um, so, yeah, it would be. It, it would, would be, be great fascinating story. to It'd do be that. A great story. It would be fascinating yeah. to do that. Um, well, since our time is limited, I won't take as much time on that. I mean, I could. This is really something I would be interested to hear more about. But why don't we go ahead a little bit? Because I know then you went to college. I did go to the University of Washington. Um, okay. Uh, under affirmative action, or whatever you want to call it, EEOC, I gladly took that. <laughs> And again, we found ourselves at the University of Washington at a time when there wasn't much diversity there either. And at one point, uh, the Black Student Union closed this campus down to demand the hiring of more African American faculty members. Now, what years were these? This is in the early 70s. So I, this, I'm thinking this is about 71, 72, okay. when we actively sought the integration of the campus. Mm -hmm. There was a a uh, college professor in the business school that was kind of pushed forward, hired, and took on the role, and I'm, uh, and I'm an alum of the Foster School of Business now at the University of Washington, so I get kind of updates. There was a push for affirmative action. They hired many people I knew to run the program. Uh, a lot of students got access to the University of Washington, but I don't think it would have come as quickly if we hadn't really... I mean, we weren't the only ones, but it was... But we voiced our, our concerns. Um, you know, there's an interesting piece in this bit where this one fellow I was referencing that was a good friend of mine, a Jewish guy, um, later came to me and told me about transcendental meditation. Uh, this is a guy I went to high school with. And he said, you know, this is something that's changed my life. I said, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> You know, at that time I had been, uh, the day I graduated from high school, I said, I haven't had enough. I've got to find some relief. I went to the Black Panther headquarters the day I graduated and said, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> and what year was that? That was uh, 1967. 67? And this was in Seattle? Seattle. Um, I, was, I was looking for something to ameliorate the stress of having integrated that school and something to give back. Black Pride. Mm -hmm. um, and the Panthers, and I had been following them because quite a few of the leaders had come from SNCC, mm -hmm. Student Nonviolence non Coordinating Committee. They had graduated to the Panthers. I was watching them. Uh, you know, they were doing great work. And in Seattle, the Panthers were instrumental in bringing services to our community that weren't there previously. Mm -hmm. uh, they, we brought free lunches to school age kids, maybe a thousand kids got free lunches after a while. We asked and this was us, before the school lunch program. This was before this matter. was the this predecessor of the school lunch program. Uh, so we went to restaurants, we went to grocery stores, we asked for food, and we took them to schools and fed kids that didn't have money for lunch. There was a uh, a library in the central area, which was the black community, that was some innocuous name. We asked them to change it to Douglas Truth. Uh, Many, many years later, people are saying, who is Douglas Truth? <laughs> I mean, they didn't know Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth, but we had urged the public library to change the name. It's still a landmark. And another thing we did was health care was, the disparities were unbelievable. We were able to work with the hospitals and whatnot to set up a clinic in the central area where people had access to free health care, screenings, etc. So, while the Panthers may have a reputation of who knows, you know, whatever people <laughs> think they are, this was the work we were doing in Seattle. The work was so profound, and the mayor at that time, Charlie Royer, was so bright. He said, you know what, I know those, those guys' parents, because, you know, he knew my dad, he knew the, the Dixons. Let me see if I can work with them. And I'm sure he got pushback, but it was brilliant because he brought the leaders of the Panthers in the Seattle um, government and put them to work in the Park Department working with young people. For 30 years, the Aaron Brothers worked in the Park Department in Seattle and did all kinds of things that we probably will never know about. But that was the brilliance 
versus places like Chicago where Fred Hampton was assassinated and kind of all kinds of things. But, but these, the Panthers was great, but I went back to, I'm still looking for something. And that's where my friend Alan, you know, talked to me about TM and getting involved in that that led me kind of to being with you today, uh, was seeing the value in TM for the work that we were doing. The work that the community needed to do, the healing that needed to go on, the resilience that young people needed. I think I saw that uh, as I started Transdome Meditation. I'm going to come back to that, but um, you mentioned SNCC. Yes. Were you in SNCC? I was not in SNCC. Not in SNCC. Okay. I was a little too young at uh -huh. point. SNCC. Okay. And you know, I was in Seattle. There was certainly the Urban League, the NAACP, um, some other. You know, our churches were very active. Mm -hmm. SNCC was still just a little bit before my time because the folks that left SNCC, um, you know, Huey Newton, all the other folks, uh, H. Rep. Brown, Stokely Carver, all of them came west to Oakland. Ah. You know, founded the national headquarters for the Black Oakland, Panthers. For the Black Panthers. And they became the Black Panther Party, which was the name they took from an army brigade. <laughs> It, during World War II, it had been kind of these kind of Black Panthers. Uh -huh. uh, so its origins actually went even further back than the Panthers themselves. There was a lot of history uh, around the name. Um, and they came up the coast of Seattle, and I can remember one afternoon sitting on the lawn of Garfield High School, listening to H. Rep. Brown and Stoker Carmichael talking about why the Black Panthers, why we need to be active in our community. About a block or two down the road, we began to see this brigade of policemen. They had riot gear on. We think, we're just sitting here having a conversation. <laughs> and they thought that, you know, all heck was going to break loose if they didn't contain us. Um, we continued our discussion, peacefully dispersed, but there was this continuing kind of tension between the growth of kind of this black awareness and what the police may have perceived as a threat. Mm -hmm. Because certainly by that time the FBI had infiltrated the Black Panthers. As you know, J. Edgar Hoover had put the Panthers way up there on <laughs> this list of folks to get right below Dr. King. And we were feeding kids breakfast. We demonstrated in front of the Seattle Yacht Club because it wouldn't allow black folks in. We demonstrated in front of Seattle Tennis club because it wouldn't allow Jews or blacks in. You know, it was all peaceful, nonviolent, but certainly there was uh, threatening to the yes, order. absolutely. <laughs> if I had a yacht there, I might. Uh, yeah, what do they do? Yeah, absolutely. And to the credit of our the major churches, black churches in Seattle, they let us in. They let us come and talk to them. Um, I mean, by then, I'd been in first day me all my life. So when I went to the pastor and said. We're trying to feed kids. He said, well, come on in. You know, let's talk about it. So, you know, there was that interesting thing, the intergenerational dynamic uh, between uh, the young, rising, energetic, whoever we are, mm -hmm. and the established blacks who had fought a battle in their time mm -hmm. to even get those churches there and, and have, have them sustained. Uh, it was very interesting. I'm, I'm going to be looking forward now to having the uh, Democratic Party and the proponents of the school lunch program and the school breakfast programs give appropriate credit to the Black Please. Panther Party for starting that. <laughs> Please. Because that's Absolutely. something I had not heard. Absolutely. That's where it started. So you, you finished high school, you yeah. joined the Black Panther Party, you were doing these various community activities, right? and then your friend told you about TM. Yeah, there was still something that I was looking for that I got neither through the activism with the Panthers Certainly I enjoyed uh, working in the community, uh, continuing my father's work, but there was something I was still looking for. Some, maybe it was inner peace, I don't know what you would call it, but when Alan took me to my first TM lecture at the University of Washington, there must have been 200 people in the room. I was the first one up front to talk to the teacher about how do I sign up for this thing. I, I have to tell you, I'm not sure I understood everything he said. But there was something subtler in the message that made sense. The inner qualities, the true experience of peace, um, that appealed to me. So. And what year was that? That was 
1969. 1969. And what is Alan's last name? Serebrin. 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 Mm -hmm. um, so, you, and there were 200 people in the introductory lecture? Easy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because, Victor, those were the days when the transdevelopmentation movement had really elected to work on college campuses. It was a big strategy, and certainly in Los Angeles, where its headquarters were, UCLA was not far away, USC, but across the country, there's a real focus on the Student International Meditation Society, mm -hmm. uh, where many people actually heard about TM, mm -hmm. and maybe even here in North Carolina. Oh yeah, absolutely. We had a Sims chapter here in right. Chapel Hill. So, um, yeah, so. So this was 1969, and you were, it was at the University of Washington? Yes. You heard the lecture? Absolutely. Okay. And did you decide to learn right away? I did. Uh, in those days, you know, it was expensive. $40, right? $35. 35 <laughs> So I had to wait a while to collect money, but I can even remember the day I went for instruction. I, I was living somewhere else, but I stopped by mother, my mother's house to clip some flowers out of her, you know, and all those, the things I had to bring and whatnot. Right. Um, and went, uh, was instructed. I, I had cowboy boots and bell bottoms and, you know, some <laughs> crazy outfit on. But it worked the very first time I experienced it. And I said, wow. Now, back in those days in Seattle, there was no resident TM teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, we had itinerant teachers who would come through the area and um, teach us. Who was your teacher? Bob Winquist. Bob Winquist. Winquist. Uh huh. Okay. So. Um, Give him a shout out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, this is interesting. I was thinking about this this morning. We formed our own meditation. When the teachers left, every Friday we would get together for our own kind of group meditation. And because what began to happen was 